you can have a million thoughts in your head about a million different things, but when you're sitting in a forest and you just hear the birds chirping and the wind blowing through the trees, you just realize everything's going to be okay. That realization that everything's going to be okay. Who hasn't felt it after hiking in a forest or soaking in a glorious sunset? Maybe no one needs that feeling more than America's veterans when they return from being in harm's way. That was Robin Eckstein speaking a moment ago. She served in the Army's 1st Armored Division, driving supply missions in Iraq. And when she came home after a total of seven and a half years in combat zones, She found solace during visits to places like Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. In this episode of After the Fact from the Pew Charitable Trusts, we're talking about our national parks, their backlogged maintenance needs, and what this means to America's veterans. I'm your host, Dan LaDuke, and Robin was among the many veterans who have traveled to Washington to push for action on needed repairs to the parks. A lot of our national parks have military heritage associated with them, and so you know, they're especially mean something to veterans to be able to go there and see our history and know that we're still being thought of um, afterwards. And if you can think to yourself, this is what I was fighting for, these national treasures, you know, Crater Lake National Park, making sure that it's there for everyone else. I want I want that to be the reason why I fight. There are more than 400 national parks preserving some of the country's most iconic landscapes. But as Robin noted, 156 of them honor veterans. And that's our data point for this episode. These 156 sites are battlefields, forts, and cemeteries. Reminders of past triumphs and tragedies. Places like Gettysburg National Military Park and Fort McHenry. Sadly, these hollowed places are beset with crumbling roads, closed trails, and leaky sewer pipes. The needed repairs add up to $6 billion dollars nearly half of the total $11.6 billion maintenance backlog for all the national parks. Robin says it's more important than ever that we care for these special places, for veterans and for everyone else, too. We have these beautiful parks here, um, these stretches of land that are just unbelievably gorgeous that no one else has. If we're going to have things for our future and for our children, they have to be taken care of. There's no reason why we can't step up and make sure that they are a priority for us. Joshua Tui also wants to make the parks a priority, and for the rest of this episode, we'll talk with him about why they are so important to him and other veterans. Josh lost his legs serving in the U.S. Army in Afghanistan, and he worked toward his recovery by hiking in the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. He now works with young people and other veterans to maintain park trails there. I was with a uh, striker brigade uh, out of Fort Lewis, Washington. I was in uh, southeastern Afghanistan, uh, an area called the Zabul province. Had a great experience there, uh, but it ended a little shorter than I would have liked. Um, uh, it was a Thursday, I believe, in uh, September, uh, September 24th, 2009, that I ended up getting uh, uh, hurt. I, um, our vehicle encountered an improvised explosive device. Um, I was sitting in the back, uh, up top on one of the machine guns, and um, yeah, the rest is kind of history. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Uh, and so you you were wounded and brought back to the United States. Correct. Yeah. And that's uh, that's where the the real journey began, I suppose. Okay. So, um, yeah, I ended up working uh, rehabbing out of Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center, which was uh, then in D.C. and now it's up in Bethesda. Um, you know, v- vigorous rehab, physical rehab. I uh, lost my right leg uh, above the knee, which uh, posed a series of challenges that uh, you know still to this day I, I encounter. Um, you know, uneven terrain and uh, just pacing myself on, on some certain days, but. Uh, I was I was really committed and adamant about uh, regaining a level of physical confidence and, and capability. Um, that was something that I took pride in, you know, as a service member. Um, you know, being physically fit, I was an infantryman. You pretty quickly upon your return started seeking out the national parks. I did. And so, what did you feel uh, some of these first times out there when you were when you were trying things out again? Sure. Uh, physical exhaustion, I think, would, would be yeah. the first thing that comes yeah. to mind. Um, I, I walk with uh, hiking poles and, you know, it's a real physical task, you know, for, for able-bodied folks. And so for me to go out there and, and do it, um, you know, the uneven terrain and the uh, 
the steep inclines in some places. Um, it's just it's a physical test that I, that I enjoy. Um, it's a sense of accomplishment when you do it, and it had a healing property in a way because it you know when you get through it and you do it enough times, you start to believe that you know this is something that you can do. Um, and I had to prove that to myself. You know, I was kind of living in denial for a period of time, and you know, not wanting to get out and be as active. Um, but you know, just to get you out there, I mean, it, as soon as I come back, I want to go right back mm. out there again. Um, so I can understand the physical side of it, and 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 the, and the confidence building side of it. Is there are there other things that that maybe speak to the inner part of you uh, when you're there? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know the. The serenity, certainly the calmness, um, you know, the silence is so nice. I live under 395. There's a, you know, I have car, I hear cars and I hear uh, the planes flying over at Reagan. I know it's six o'clock in the morning when they start when taking yeah. off. And to get out there and break away for a weekend and do that is um, absolutely paramount to, to the mental health uh, for me personally. And I'm sure that's shared with a number of other Americans. But And that's the thing, you know, these, these parks are, of course, special for all Americans, but um, for you and other veterans, I'm, I imagine they, they also have an added significance. Absolutely. Um, you know, many of the folks uh, who join the service are proud of their service and they're proud to represent their country. And part of that representation, I think, is, you know, the physical, you know, lands that we have here. And, and those are, you know, uh, encapsulated through the national park system. You know, the, the sort of the crown jewels of, of what we have to offer here in, in America. Have you discussed this then with other veterans that you know? Yeah, I have. I work with uh, other veterans on this issue. Um, and, you know, it's something that we, we talk about, you know, and it's a source, again, back to the source of pride, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of, it's unfortunate that uh, they've gotten to the state of disrepair. Um, again, I mean, they're, they're, the monuments to to our nation, um, and if we can't take care of those things that are that are in our backyard, right. that you know, um, what does that say about us as a society? So, what are you doing? I work for uh, for an organization called the Core Network out here in D.C., and um, we represent the Nation's Service and Conservation Corps. We try to get opportunities for uh, young people and veterans, uh, which was really what what drew me to the organization as well, um, to engage in service projects, building trails, you know, restoring habitat. Um, wildfire remediation is a, is a big issue as well. You know, the park system itself represents such a, a unique challenge, but also an opportunity to engage, you know, lots and lots more people in these kinds of projects, um, you know, to, to forge a common bond and, and have a sense of purpose um, and to, to come together for something greater than, than any one individual. And what would you urge other Americans to do about all of this? Um, you know, engage uh, civically with, you know, your, your state and local representation uh, and, and get out to D.C. if you can um, or get engaged with groups that uh, liaison out here. Every voice counts. I mean, if we had, you know, 300 plus million last year visiting these park systems, I mean, that's a sizable chunk of our, of our population. Yeah. You know, if you can get a, a fraction of that uh, talking and on the same page and expressing your interests, uh, you know, and, and explaining what these mean to you and, you know, talk about some of the economics and, and, and what that contributes uh, to your community that you live in. The gateway communities and the, the areas right outside are, are uh, critical to the livelihood of some of these towns. And they generate so much, so much revenue, you know, through the outfitters to the, to the tour guides and the boating guides and the, um, you know, the, the maintenance folks who, who work out there and the hospitality industry and the lodging and, and so on and so forth. And um, we sell, uh, you know, some trinkets or something to, to folks who are going into the park system and, you know, some provisions of sorts. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to showcase that as well. So I'd encourage everyone to, to be engaged on the issues. And Josh, will we see you in a park again soon? Absolutely. I plan on going this weekend. So will we see you out there? You the question. Will. Great. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. If you want to learn more about the national parks, check out our previous episode about the deferred maintenance backlog. You can find it as well as more background on the parks and our other past episodes at pewtrust.org slash after the fact. As always, we appreciate you listening and appreciate your reviews on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact.